This is Regenerative Skills, the podcast helping you to learn the skills and solutions to create an abundant and connected future. I'm your host, Oliver Gaucher. New Society Publishers has been a leader in sustainable publishing for over 40 years now. They're an activist, solutions-oriented publisher focused on bringing you tools for a world of change. They've now published over 600 books available both in print and ebooks, as well as an increasing library of audiobook selection as well. They care deeply about both what they publish and how they do business, and so the same thinker and doer approach permeates their in-house work and the books themselves. A certified B Corporation, they print on 100% post-consumer recycled paper, And they are carbon neutral, and they print only in North America, never offshore. And that's just the company themselves. Most importantly, they've got the best selection of books that you need to build your own regenerative ecological or community-based projects. You can check out their full list of titles now at NewSociety.com. Hey everybody, and welcome back. So a lot of my work these days revolves around communicating with farmers around Europe who are at various stages of transition towards regenerative management. For many different reasons, farmers are looking for solutions outside of the conventional industry of chemical and technological manipulations and are rediscovering the potential of partnering with natural cycles and processes, especially thanks to recent advances in our understanding of the natural world. Now, though there are a handful of examples of growers who have been pioneering these practices around the continent for quite a while, the vast majority are fairly early in their journeys. It's still rare to find an experienced commercial grower who has found success through organic, no-till, and low-input systems. But luckily, there are a few who have shown that this is possible and are sharing their knowledge and experience. And I'm thrilled to be able to feature one of them in today's session, where I'll be speaking with Helen Athow. Helen has worked for 35 years in connecting farming, food systems, land stewardship, and conservation. She currently farms and does soil and natural enemies habitat building research on her new five-acre farm in western Montana. Helen has a Master's of Science in Horticulture from Rutgers University and even studied with renowned Japanese farmer Masanobu Fukuoka. She has worked in education and research at Rutgers, the University of Arkansas, and Oregon State University and was a horticulture extension agent in Montana for 17 years. Helen was also a board member for the Organic Farming Research Foundation between 2000 and 2005 and advisor for Wild Farm Alliance between 2018 and 19. Now, from the beginning, she owned and operated a 30-acre certified organic vegetable and fruit farm in Montana and then later went on to co-own with her late husband a 26-acre certified organic orchard in California. From there, together they moved to a 211-acre organic farm in eastern Oregon, doing mainly orchard and vegetable production. And the two of them also created educational videos during that time on their YouTube channel called Agrarian Dreams and did video presentations about their ecological farming methods. Now, Helen is the author of the new book, The Ecological Farm, a minimalist, no-till, no-spray, selective weeding, grow-your-own-fertilizer system for organic agriculture. And that is exactly what we'll be focusing on in our interview today. Now, as a reflection of many of the discussions happening within the climate farmers community at the moment, Helen and I really dug into the unique goals that she and her husband had during their farming careers and how they gauged their success. We talk about the way they measured progress on their journey towards a healthy yet low input system for both their orchard and vegetable crops, as well as the routines and practices that brought them the best results. Now, much more than just the knowledge and practices of her farming experience, Helen brings a remarkable mindset of constant learning and experimentation to this conversation that is now informing her new five-acre project in Montana. And we also cover the most important learnings that she has gained through her career and how it informs the establishment of all her new research. Now quickly, before we get into the interview, just remember that these conversations are just the starters for the learning and the exploration that is happening every day in the two online communities that I'm managing. The Climate Farmers community is just for active farmers in Europe, and you can apply to join for free at climatefarmers.org. And for anyone else around the world, whether you are farming or not, you can join the Regenerative Skills Discord server for free through the links at the homepage at regenerativeskills.com or our link in our bio on Instagram. So now I'll hand things over to Helen Athow. 
Alden, welcome to the Regenerative Skills Podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for making time. Oh, thank you. It's such an honor. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we tried a couple of times. We had some technical difficulties. So now I've really built up this excitement over a couple of weeks. Uh, what do you say we just jump right in? <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So, Helen, to start things off, your new book on ecological farming covers a lot of different things. Why don't you give us your background and how you started in with farming yourself? Well, actually, I grew up in Montana, which is kind of a cold climate here in the United States. And I grew up mainly with ranching and, uh, and, and grain production. And then I went to college and was interested in environmental studies. And I, and I, I ended up studying agriculture and ecology. So I, I was already focused on that 40 years ago. And then I met and got to work with Masanobu Fukuoka, who wrote The One Straw Revolution. And boy, all of that ecology really started to, to become practical. How do you have this, this system that multifunctions on so many levels? And uh, and then I've spent the last 40 years trying to figure out how to how to make that happen. I I studied at the Land Institute in in Kansas and uh, really read uh, uh, ecological science and blended that in with the practical experience. And and then I got my own farm, uh, even as I was working in, in agriculture uh, as an extension agent and decided I could experiment. And finally, I met my late husband who had been experimenting doing the same things, trying to have ground cover that's permanent so that, that you're mimicking a, a natural forest system where, where you have all different levels of, of root systems being in, engaged in your, in your plant community. So, it sounds easy when you just say it that way, but it's been 40 years of trying to figure out how to make, how to allow nutrient cycling, natural nutrient cycling to occur and, and create systems where natural biological control and suppression of diseases and insects works and and how to make all of those relationships work together and still provide food for humans <laughs> what could it's go wrong such a complex dance and before we go into analyzing what you learned through your own farming experience i would love to know what it was like to work and study with masanobu fukuoka because he's such a pillar of the start of this regenerative farming revolution and is an inspiration to so many people like myself. What was it like working with them in Japan? Well, what I realized was first of all, that he had already forgotten more biological and ecological science than, than at that point I knew or maybe would ever know that remember that he had this incredible background and he he came at really knowing how to listen to the land with a, an ability to understand the language of 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 plants and and other organisms which is which is a biochemical language that that plants and insects and soil microbes all interact together with so I, I that was really clear to me that this this understanding of the natural world was so much deeper than uh, than most of us have, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And then it it was learning to to really pay attention and uh, and be willing to let things be messy. Ecology is messy. That's a really good insight. And I mean, of all of the interviews that I've done at this point, I'm closing in on 300 of the people with the longest amount of experience. That is probably the most common insight that I hear from people is that rather than trying to control things, rather taking a step back, being patient and observing 
looking beyond necessarily what your initial observation is and, and wait for it to unfold and see the nuance and the multiple layers and the interactions and the relationships in the ecology that you're you're paying attention to often leads to insights and management potential that you would not see had you not taken that time. Has that been your experience as well? Oh, absolutely. The things that we have been doing for the last 10 years, if you'd asked me, and I was a maverick in graduate school, if you'd asked me when I was in graduate school studying plant physiology and horticulture, I would have said, this is, it, it's not possible. I, I still keep waiting for the system to fall apart. Uh, this, this orchard uh, that we did in Eastern Oregon, uh, this entirely no-till, no spray, no weeding, grow our own fertility orchard. It hasn't had any off-farm fertilizer since 2016, where we just added uh, minerals to the tree hole as we, as we planted them and then lots of mowed living mulch. I, I keep waiting for the system as we're now harvesting and getting good yields and great quality. I'm still waiting for the system to fall apart. And, <laughs> and at some point, I think it will need inputs, but here we are in 2023, and uh, I'm just shocked at how healthy and strong the trees look without any nitrogen fertilizer except our grow our own mowed and blowed in living mulch. And I, I have to tell you that 20 years ago, I wouldn't have thought that was possible. And, and so my mind would have kept me from trying because I didn't believe it. That is truly remarkable. And it, it brings to mind the fact that you said so many things that you didn't do there even more than the actual practices that you are implementing. And it's, it's also reflected in the title of the book. So the title being The Ecological Farm, a minimalist, no-till, no-spray, selective weeding, grow your own fertilizer system for organic agriculture. And in that, there's a lot of, you know, the practices that you don't implement. We're at this point right now in farming where we often differentiate ourselves from what is common by the practices that we don't do. And I'm wondering, you probably don't describe your type of farming through the things you don't do to yourself and to your friends who understand it. How do you describe it for yourself? Because it's often not through negatives, right? Well, that's right. That's a good point. And, and, and the title is somewhat provocative because in my perennial system, in the orchard, we have figured out how to do a, no, a truly no-till system, and, and it's being economically successful. In the annual vegetable system, I have to say that I am figuring out how to try and perennialize an annual system so that we're rotating places where we disturb the soil, so that it is not truly an organic no-till system. It is selective, as I call it, selective strip tillage within a, a perennial system where we have living, living mulches that are perennial between the crop rows, but throughout the, over time, the, the crop beds uh, get strip tillage. But the, the goal being, again, why do we do something? If, we're, if we are going to do something instead of not doing, why? And, and what's the ecological function? And so for the strip tillage in the annual vegetables, I only till when I'm adding residues to the soil, cover crops, uh, mowed in living mulch that will feed the soil microbial community. So if I'm going to disturb, I'm going to push my system towards the benefit of one of the, the important components of that system. And in this case, the, the microbial community, but, but not far away, I have the perennial living roots of the, the living mulch that's no-till so that even as I disturb the system, there is a place to recolonize it. Mm -hmm close by so that at, just as we rotate crops, 
we rotate where we disturb the soil in a in a given growing season, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely it does. And it also fits in with what I've studied in ecology in that so many of the things that we try and cultivate, especially in a garden, are pretty early succession annuals or domesticated versions of that class of plants, which tend to emerge after a disturbance event in the natural succession towards a more stable either perennial pasture or perennial forest system. And in order to maintain the biological communities both around them above ground and in the soil, every once in a while a disturbance event is necessary or it's one of the easier interventions in order to maintain that balance that favors that class of plants. Is that also in line with your thinking there? Exactly. And, and I spend the first introduction part of my book talking about systems and, and, and how they change, how when you plant a plant, it changes the whole soil community where, where it's growing and those changes compound upon one another and, and everything that we do within our garden or our farm then changes the system and it moves from this early successional stage to later stages and then later stages move back, as you say, after natural disturbances into these early successional stages. And I think that's an important way to think about gardening and farming, that there are these, these moving systems from, from uh, early to late successional stages and maybe for five or so years hitting what I like to call a dynamic equilibrium stage and and then you you can basically do less and less, but that that you keep an eye on nature and see what the natural world is telling you when you need to intervene and when you can get away with intervening very little. Mm. So we've started to get into the details already here, but what do you say we take a little step back and give some context to our listeners about what type of farm you've been or farming practices you've been practicing for yourself out in Eastern Oregon. Tell me about your operation there, what you were producing, maybe a little bit about the climate so we can understand what your experience comes from. Yes, it's a, it's a zone five. So we have cold winters and, and hot summers. Uh, it's a low uh, precipitation, so about... Uh, 13 to 15 inches of, of precip. And, uh, and I live in a, a, a river valley, or I lived uh, in a river valley. So uh, there's a river that comes out of the mountains and provides, I have to say, uh, I am blessed, uh, and all my farms have been blessed with a wonderful gravity feed irrigation because they're on slight uh, hills. So I have, um, I have a, a very nice uh, uh, water system and, and not a bad climate system. Uh, the soil fertility was relatively low, but it was good soil, uh, good river bottom or stream uh, derived soil. And what we decided, it had been in pasture, uh, in, in cattle production and, uh, well, hay production anyway, for about 50 years. And we decided to do uh, orchards and vegetables. So the orchard uh, was stone fruit, peaches, nectarines, apricots, cherries, plums, and pluots, my favorite, these wonderful plum apricot crosses and uh, apples and pears. Uh, and then the vegetables were, um, oh, just a, a, a diversity of many different uh, kinds of, of annual uh, vegetables. Uh, some perennial um, uh, small fruits like strawberries and raspberries, uh, but um, uh, a focus on uh, on transplanted crops and less seeded crops in our uh, high residue uh, reduced tillage system, uh, but still uh, some seeded crops. Uh, but main, but we had the most. We have had the most success with our transplanted crops. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Trying to seed in all of that residue and the texture that comes in with that, most of the seeders can't get through or they struggle with it. Exactly, exactly, right, yeah. Now, to set the stage a little for what we're gonna talk about within the book, you divided the book into two parts. The first one being farming at the intersections of ecological relationships, which is one of my biggest fascinations. And then crop management and troubleshooting with an ecological approach, which is really practical and talking about the individual cultivars and the troubleshooting guides that go along with those. So let's start with the first part and talk about some of the principles that you have learned in your experience for managing these complex ecological relationships, which earlier you made sound so simple. <laughs> Yes, and, and we basically come up with a recipe of, of 10 principles. And I think of those, the, uh, they, they all interact. I, I think one of the, the things that I lay out in the first part is I try to make a case for systems thinking and thinking about our farms and our gardens in terms of a systems approach. And instead of managing individual crops, which is what I did for the first 20 years of my farming, knowing everything about what the crops need and what their preferences are, consider that, but also try and manage the, the intertwining the overlapping ecological principles and relationships within the larger garden or, or farm plant community. So that's basically what I'm, I'm really trying to do in, in, in the first part of the book. But of course, just what you and I talked about, that there are systems that require more or less intervention as time goes on. And so the second part of the book is all of the fiddly details <laughs> of, of each crop. So I go through at least the crops that, that I know best in terms of vegetable crops and tree fruit crops and talk about what their preferences are so that as you're creating a system, you can shift the balance shift the ecological balance over towards your crops and away from the rest of the components in the system in, until your crops are ready to handle that. Mm. So that's, I, I think, why the book is laid out in those, in those two types of, uh, in, 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 the, in the two parts. And getting back to the, the ecological principles, boy, uh, they're all important when you think about managing relationships in terms of just, uh, or, or managing ecological relationships rather than just managing crops. But I think the, the three most important are if you can figure out creative ways to maintain a living root in the soil year round. And that doesn't mean that it's always growing in my cold Montana climates, they, they will go dormant, but how to maintain undisturbed roots. And then how to maintain diverse above and below soil cover, because, because it turns out, as we mentioned, plants are, are changing and making their plant community, they're, or they're making the entire community, they're making the microbial community, they're affecting all of it. So you want to have a diversity of root architecture, different kinds of uh, deep roots versus fibrous roots, perennial versus annual, and the fact that different plant species have different root exudates, so they're changing that rhizosphere. So below ground diversity and then above ground diversity so that you have as much habitat for all of the beneficial organisms, the, the predator and parasite insects, the birds, the pollinators, the reptiles, wildlife, all of what I like to call our free ecosystem providers. So a diversity of above and below ground soil cover. And then I guess 
Oh, I, I was going to say only three, but now I'm going to make it five. <laughs> selective fertilization, selective weeding, all permaculturists know about chop and drop. And, and then finally, creating habitat for all of the beneficial biological control organisms within your plant community. So within your garden, within your farm, rather than on the edges so that all of your beneficial insects, for example, can live where they work. They don't have to commute to work from an insectary or from uh, some undisturbed habitat. They can, you create habitat underneath or within your crops. So that was a, that was a long-winded way of talking about the ecological principles, but I, I do spend basically the first uh, the first eight chapters talking about them. So, so it, it's kind of hard to simple, simplify, isn't it? Oh, hardly. If anything, you may have even oversimplified. I mean, you mentioned the 10 principles and you kept it down to five, but I'm more than happy to continue to explore those. But you've got a lot in your book about soil specifically. I know this is a hot topic right now. Everybody is talking about how to increase soil health, how to increase microbial and mycorrhizal communities for all of the importance that we're only just starting to discover, how did you approach soil fertility and health on your operation? Well, it, it was it was an evolution. Uh, one of the soil chapters is, is called the soil revolution. And basically uh, I did things differently, made mistakes, paid attention as Masanobu Fukuoka taught me to do, uh, perhaps uh, slowly, uh, I could have paid atten more attention and perhaps learned faster, uh, but I basically tried things and watched what happened on a systems level. So for example, on my farm in the 1990s in Montana, I, I had living mulches, but I had what I call an annual living mulch system. So each spring I would add compost, I would make and add compost, and then I would till in the living mulches from the previous year and I would make beds and then I would plant my living mulches between the rows. And that system worked very well for yield, but over time, I began to notice that I was getting an excess of nutrients and particularly nitrogen went just off the chart. And I was excited because of course, when I was in graduate school, I was told that as organic farmers, we could never get our nutrient levels in the soil as high as conventional farmers. So for a while, I was kind of proud of this excess nitrogen. But then I began to see blossom end rot on tomatoes and a little bit of, of you know, blossom end rot on peppers, uh, sweet peppers and tomatoes being my main crops. And I began to think about nutrient interactions and I looked at that excessive nitrogen and excessive phosphorus and excessive potassium. And I said, hmm, I think these living mulches that I'm mowing and leaving on the soil surface all season are adding a lot more nutrients than I thought. What if I started to decrease the compost? And then finally, I just got rid of the compost and I learned to grow my own fertilizer. But it it was a, a 10 year period before I really had the courage to do commercial organic vegetable production, just growing my own fertilizers. So soil tests, watching my crops over a 10, 15 year period, I went from being what I call a, a nitrogen hoarder where my, my living mulches, even my perennial living mulches were legumes, right? So nitrogen fixers to going to the Oregon farm where we said, hmm, look what we've got. Can we just maintain what we've got? This 50 year old pasture that is a, a, a multitude of grass species and different clovers and alfalfa and, and weed species as well, deep rooted weeds like chicory and annual weeds like um, 
like like chickweed, can we just maintain all of that without disturbing it? And and for the orchard, mulch where each tree is going to go. So we put about 50 pounds of, of hay mulch uh, harvested from other parts of the farm where each tree would go. And then, as I've mentioned with the vegetables, do strip tillage of that 50 year old pasture and, and leave the uh, perennial living mulch in between. So that was where we began to experiment with how do you deal with uh, a higher carbon, lower nitrogen, diverse species cover crop living mulch? And, and that's basically what we came to in the Oregon farm. And, and as I mentioned, works very well uh, with the orchard. Uh, still shocking to me. And you can see the pictures in the, in the book that it looks like a lot of competition in that orchard, doesn't it? A lot of, of plant competition. So maintaining that nutrient cycling is, is really key. So I've mentioned, I guess, all the... The, the basic premise of how we how how I got to the Oregon system, but there's lots of little details. Do you want me to go into that, or are there have I have I'll I answered what, that question? Yeah, you answered that question wonderfully. I, I, let's take it the same way you did with your book. So let's go from patterns down to details. So we'll get around to that. <laughs> oh, I, I like how you've said that. Patterns down to details is the perfect way of thinking about it, I think. Yeah, that's the common way of saying it in the permaculture circles. It's, it's very succinct. So with that approach, uh, much like you said at the beginning, it seems like an ideal problem to have an excess of nutrients. But <laughs> as you started to understand more about the cycles and the balance that's necessary, as is often talked about in, in soil health circles these days, an excess of something could really block the absorption or the utility of other elements that are just as essential within the system. And an excess of nitrogen, especially in conventional growing, is often one of those main culprits that is blocking the, the absorption and the utility of other nutrients. And finding that balance and you know really observing to figure out what which of those cycles and where you could allocate resources that came from your farm eventually got you to an equilibrium and then into this grow your own fertilizers situation where you are. Now, before we get into that, I would like to understand within this larger picture of health and diversity that you've been cultivating up until now, how does that fit in with the analogy of an immune system, which you write about in your book? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because it goes right back to what we were talking about in terms of why excess nutrients can be problematic. So for example, if you have excessive nitrogen in your soil, it changes the, the, the root exudates, it changes the, the soil microbial community, it changes even the leaf biological community in your in your fruit tree for example so that that if you have excesses of nitrogen you set up a whole different system than if you have a, a, a lower nitrogen more balanced carbon system so let me give you a, a great example so with our peach trees we used to have a, a, a disease called brown rot as a problem. As we moved towards less and less high nitrogen fertilizer to really low nitrogen in the system, in the whole soil system, the whole plant community system, we had less and less brown rot problem. And the, the answer is multifaceted. Because what we found is lower nitrogen in the, in the fruit tissue, in the peach tissue, made it less susceptible to brown rot disease. But we also found that the micronutrients that were more prevalent in the fruit made it more, less, it, it turned on its immune system. 
So we had, we had more antioxidants, we had more vitamin C. I've read a wonderful study recently that higher vitamin C, lower nitrogen in peach fruit made it less susceptible to brown rot. Isn't that amazing? And, 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 and so these, these, these different plant defensive chemicals that were produced in these lower nitrogen fruits and leaves made them less susceptible to diseases and, and in, in fact, insects as well. So just that one little thing of, of minimizing that excessive nitrogen that we've been so dependent on changed the entire system and helped the plant to, if you will, focus on, on, a, on a more complex immune system. Very interesting. And that makes a lot of sense. But what I'm curious to know from your experience is, what are you observing? What are you measuring or looking for that gives you feedback as to the health or the function of the immune system of the plants that you're managing? Yes. And, and so I used to do, uh, and I still do some, uh, soil tests and tissue tests. Um, but I've come to this strange realization, uh, Oliver, uh, that I don't know the answer. That, mm -hmm. in, <laughs> that we're trying, uh, my late husband and I were trying to figure out with, with this new high residue no-till, minimum soil disturbance, lower nitrogen, higher carbon system that we're doing, how do we measure it? And our, our standard soil tests uh, were not as, as effective. So we, we've been doing um, microbial analysis um, uh, and that, that's helpful. Uh, we experimented with our old standard uh, soil tests, you know, that look at uh, uh, percent organic matter, for example. And we did what's called the Haney test. So the Haney test measures not only the soluble nutrient levels, but also the organic uh, uh nitrogen and uh, or uh, the organic levels of nutrient the stuff that's tied up in the in the soil community as it as it breaks down and and i think that that's part of the answer but i i don't have ways of of measuring it i don't necessarily have a good way of of understanding except to look at how the plants are growing uh, so, back to the way that we are understanding whether our system is functioning and our immune system is effective is by, by basically back to watching how the trees and the, and the crops grow. And if I start to see poor growth, or a little bit of off color leaves, I jump in immediately with an intervention. But until then, I am doing less until my plants tell me they need it. But, but I need to tell you that I am, I'm still figuring this out. <laughs> okay, no, but this is exactly why I want insights from someone with your experience. Because like you said, you've tried many different lab tests, and observations with different devices, but you're, I see you're defaulting back to your own senses and observations from the field. What are, look, maybe let's take an example of a cultivar where you could see something very noticeable that could give you an insight as to what the intervention you need to make is. Can you give me an example from something you've grown? I can actually. So when we do these annual crops that as you say, are early successional. So tomatoes, I put my, my I do my, uh, my strip tillage. Uh, I'm adding only plant residues. So I'm, I'm adding a very high carbon fertilizer to jumpstart my microbial system and get it going. But in my cold Oregon soils in the spring, it takes a while for that microbial community to get 
get to their most active stages and decompose the residues that we're putting on to change those organic nutrients into the soluble nutrients that my tomatoes can take up. So what I sometimes can see, if it's really cool, if my microbial community is not really active yet, or if I've I've erred a little on the side of too high a carbon, too low a nitrogen phosphorus residue addition, I can start to see signs of nitrogen deficiency, for example. And then I say, okay, I need to either make sure my soil is warm so I can cover my plants with a row cover to keep them warmer, or, and maybe at the same time, I can add a little liquid fertilizer and I have a, a mix that I came up with, and I actually have the recipe in the book, um, uh, a liquid that I will drench the roots with and try and warm it up so that I, again, am throwing the balance towards that annual crop that really would like a lot more of those soluble nutrients in its root system than I'm giving it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like that's the perfect segue into talking about the methodology you've come up with to cycle nutrients through your self-made fertilizer regime there. So maybe we could talk about it from both sides, the annual plants in your garden, as well as tree care and nutrition that you've come up with. Yes, and I'm so glad that you've asked the details because I, I've, I've learned that, that the details about how to manage these surface applied residues really makes a difference. So for example, in the orchard, we'll start out in the spring and, uh, and it'll be mowed pretty short because we go into the winter with our, our leaves fall and I, I prune the trees and all of that goes back to the soil because that's how we recycle nutrients, right? So the leaves fall in the winter, we prune the, the trees and all of that gets mowed into the soil. So we, we mow it pretty short. And the, the other reason we're mowing short is that we're trying to push the push-pull concept. Remember, we're trying to push one of the pests out of the orchard for the, for the winter. So voles, voles that would like to find a nice place to stay in the winter, we make sure that the, the grasses are not tall and that we leave areas below the orchard where the grasses are tall so the, the voles are there. So we move into spring, with the orchard looking pretty short, uh, the, the cover, the ground cover. And then things start to grow. And we let things grow in the middle of the, the tree row. So the alleyways in between the orchard, we let everything grow. But when the grass gets to be the grass and the clover and the alfalfa and the, and the weed species. They get to be about four to six inches. We immediately go in with, a, a, oh, about a 46 inch mower and we, blow, we mow and blow right underneath the tree. So we go down one side and then a week later we come back the other side. So we're not disturbing all the habitat at once but we're taking that succulent green, the highest nitrogen time of the season residue, and we're putting it right on the orchard as the orchard is just starting to show its first green tip or the first, the very first signs that it's gonna to start to bloom. So just as the tree wakes up in the spring, it, it gets, a uh, um, an infusion of nice green succulent residue, and it gets a little bit of suppression of the plants that are growing right in its root system. And then we do that over about a 
a, a week period. As I said, we go down one side and then we go down the other side, but we're leaving all of that undisturbed area in the, in the center for spiders and carabid beetles and rove beetles and all of our beneficial uh, organisms, snakes, <laughs> frogs that are going to be our biological control later in the season. And we leave and habitat. Let me see if I understood this correctly. So you've got three strips in the rows in between your orchard. You go and mow one on uh, one side next to the trees, putting that organic matter onto the trees when it's about four to six inches early in the spring. And then the next week you do the other side, leaving a strip in the middle to grow up quite large. Right. So we've got about, um, oh, let's say we've got about um, five to six foot of residue in the alleyways and we're mowing about uh, 46 inches on either side of the tree. Got it. Now I get it. I have really good pictures of that in the book because I know yes. uh, that uh, uh, pictures are really worth a thousand words. They really are. And there's some great images in there, some really beautiful shots. Thank you. And and I, I really think it's vital because this is uh, this right. is not intuitive. Uh, we've been That's looking right. at, at bare soil underneath crops for so many years, it's hard to think in these terms, isn't it? So, okay, so that's early spring. And then... We do the only spraying that we do on the orchard. Uh, we do uh, this wonderful mix that my late husband developed called his mineral mix. And just as the peaches begin to bloom, we make a mix of seaweed and micronutrients, uh, manganese and boron and zinc and potassium uh, and sulfur. And we spray that on the on the blossoms as kind of a uh, encouraging uh, the 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 micronutrients to start moving within the tree and um, a little bit of suppressing any disease. So we do that, and then early in the spring, of course, that's when things grow the fastest. About a month later, maybe not even, when the, when the grass grows another eight inches, we come back in and do uh, a second mowing of right underneath the tree. So we're, instead of adding fertilizer all at once in the spring, we are regularly adding residues for two reasons. Number one, we want to add that higher nitrogen residue, right? Because we're really watching the carbon to nitrogen ratios of our residue and trying to balance it out. So in the spring, we have the, the higher nitrogen residues that we can add. And then we want to suppress the growth of that competitive vegetation, plant community underneath the tree, give the tree a little bit of, of a boost. And, um, and we wanna continue to have regular decomposition because there's always a lag time, right? With our microbial community, we will give them something to decompose. They will take it into their bodies, use it for themselves first, and then they will slowly release it into the system. So there's a lag time. So to avoid having a time when there's no nutrients, we are constantly regularly adding residues. So we, we do the first mowing, then about a month later, we do the second mowing, and then um, uh, we'll do probably a third mowing um, a month later. And then depending on how things are growing, we'll do about three to five mowings in the orchard for all of the reasons I've just mentioned. As we move into summer though, of course, we're adding a different carbon to nitrogen ratio residue, aren't we? So we've moved from the higher nitrogen ratio to the higher carbon ratio, but still we're trying to go for optimum 
regular decomposition so that there's never a time when the microbes go hungry and never a time then when there aren't nutrients slowly cycling throughout the system. And then we get to the, um, the fall season and, and as I mentioned already, the leaves and the prunings all go back to the soil. So that's the orchard. Any any thoughts on that, or should I? Yes, yeah, so that is quite straightforward. It doesn't seem overly complex at all, but I would imagine that timing and observation are key to the efficacy of these these interventions, right? They really are, um, and, and not so much in the orchard. The orchard, um, at least with the you know seven to eight years that we've been doing this minimal system. Uh, seems to be pretty forgiving. Again, as long as we try to link residue addition, decomposition, and microbial breakdown of residues. We're trying to have that linked so that unlike what I used to do on my Montana farm, where I would till everything in, add a bunch of compost, and the soil microbes would get this huge boost of nutrients, and then they wouldn't get much for the rest mm -hmm. of the season, except when I uh, began learning to mow the residues in. So our microbes don't feel like that big dinner that they have to digest. They're getting smaller amounts of food all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm going to lead you after we go into the annual crops into some of the learnings of how you transitioned from a hay field up until the point where you could grow your own nutrition. But let's first talk about the analog to this with your annual garden. Yes. So with the vegetable system, again, same thing. Um, the soil is completely covered. And so I will go in. And I will say, all right, all of that, that living mulch that um, very handily grows back into the row, <laughs> into the crop row uh, in, the, uh, in the summer, late summer into fall, and then provides cover for me so I don't have to plant a cover crop. Isn't that neat? Uh, I, I, I have that growing. And what I've also done the previous fall is that the last mowing of the year, I will mow onto, you know, I'll, I'll mow down the, the crops and I'll mow down the living mulch and the weeds, everything that's grown into the bed, I mow it down. Then I mow on either side of the bed and blow that living mulch into my bed so that I have in the spring, I have residue that has been on that bed all summer. And I have, I have, well, I have living roots, don't I? I have living roots that have grown in and old crop roots. And I, I have both residue or a mulch and I have living roots. So I wait till uh, just as things start to green up, just the very first screening up. We, we barely have leaves uh, uh, starting to sprout on our cottonwood trees, for example. I'll go through and do the first tillage and I'll till all of that mulch and the roots from the previous season into that bed. And then I'll wait a week and by then, or maybe two weeks, again, it depends. Is it raining? Is it dry? Am I, I'm, I'm trying to dry out those roots so that they won't re-sprout. And I'm also waiting for the living mulch with the living roots, the perennial living mulch in my rows to start greening up, just like in the orchard. And then I mow that and blow that onto the bed. So I've got the the roots mowed in or tilled in. I've got the, the residue from the previous year tilled in. And then I add green succulent, the stuff that the microbes go crazy for. 
what I call the candy bars as opposed to the whole wheat bread. So <laughs> we, we, we give them the sugary green succulent stuff. We mow it and we immediately till it in. So we do a second tillage, but we only till when we're feeding the microbial community. So we add that green succulent stuff and we till a second time. And then we might be okay for seeded crops, or excuse me, for transplants. For seeded crops, we might do that process a third time, add another bit of residue and, and till it again. For, for things like uh, my, my brassicas, my cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts and tomatoes and peppers, they can all go in. And depending on whether the, the weather, depending on what the climate's doing, if it's cold, I might throw out some weed mat. I might roll out weed mat down a bed and warm it up for a couple of weeks after I've done that last tillage to suppress weeds and warm the soil and then roll it up uh, when I just before I plant. So uh, then I've planted and again, because systems want to want to continue to to evolve and calibrate, all of those perennial living mulches in my row middles are going to try and grow back in. So I I come through when I see anything starting to grow or when I see annual weeds germinating, and I will wheel hoe my uh, my crops, and then. I let them dry out a little bit, and by then it's been uh, it's been a long enough time that the living mulches are growing, just like in the orchard system we described. And so, when it's about six to eight inches, I will mow it after I've wheel hoed, after I've let things dry out a little bit. I will mow the living mulch, and it's now multitasking as both fertilizer adding residue in a regular way, not all at once. So we're adding more residue for nutrient cycling. We're also adding a mulch that will suppress the annual weed seeds from germinating. And we're creating habitat for spiders and ground beetles and some of our beneficial organisms. Mm. So that's that system. And then throughout the summer, I may add more residue, but I'm always leaving some undisturbed so that I have always uh, something blooming, providing pollen and nectar for my beneficial insects. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Without going in and absolutely razzing everything, which could disrupt the system a lot more than would promote the health, there is sort of a mosaic pattern that ensures that there is something in growth in flower, in seed, in vegetation at every given point. Right, the mosaic pattern is, is really key, I think, to our, our pest suppression system. But of course, what I'm really doing is in, in perennializing this annual system, I'm really growing a cover crop in the same field as my crop. Right. Yeah. So instead of growing a field of vegetables and then rotating it into a cover crop, I'm doing both at the same time. So the downside of my system is there's an opportunity cost because I have a cover crop in the field at the same time as the vegetables. So I have I, I have less space for my crop because I'm always growing fertilizer. I'm always growing habitat right next to my crops. And I guess so, that's just a compromise you have to get comfortable with when you're trying to in, become independent from outside input. There is a necessity to allocate a certain amount of growing space then for the fertility for the things that you're actually getting a yield from. And for habitat so that I no longer have to spray even certified organic materials. Absolutely. So I'm, yeah. I'm getting... A, a multifunctionality within my ecosystem, but, and my yields within my, you know, my 
uh, 48 inch uh, beds are very high, but my yield per acre is lower because I have ground that's not in production. That makes sense. And that's just the compromise you're gonna to have to be comfortable with if you have a higher priority put on resilience and independence in your system rather than an optimal or very high yielding one to offset the costs that would then come in that you know you have to, to maintain it at that high level of production. I couldn't have said it better myself, exactly. I mean, that's, I think, a compromise or a balance that more and more people are looking for. And just having it in mind from a production standpoint, which probably needs to get sorted out in the books, because at the end of the day, it is a business, that's just something to prepare yourself for if this is the type of system you'd like to move towards. Yes, exactly, exactly. But it's important to uh, to tell people that that there's a reason that we have the agricultural systems that have evolved over the last hundred years. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you are in a unique position because just before we started recording, you were telling me about the recent move that you've just done from your old farm in Oregon and actually moving back to Montana. Can you give us uh, first of all, an insight as to what prompted this move and an introduction to the project that you're starting there. Yes, well, uh, uh, both uh, both positively and negatively, I suppose. I lost my brilliant partner and husband uh, to a farm accident, and I was running this 200-acre farm in Oregon by myself. And at my age, I decided that was just getting to be too much. And I wanted to move back uh, to Montana where my uh, family and friends from, um, I grew up here are. And so I, I was looking for a smaller piece of land, uh, but not too small because by golly, I wanted to continue experimenting. And of course I wanted to continue to raise my own food. Um, uh, which I had been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. And so uh, very strange not to do that. So I found wonderful new owners uh, for the farm in Oregon who are continuing on with the uh, conservation work and with the uh, ecological orcharding. They probably won't be doing vegetable production, but they love the orchard. So... I found five acres here in Western Montana, surrounded by um, uh, mainly ranching, and I am starting a new orchard. So even though I don't have uh, my boxes unpacked yet in my house, I have the first 25 fruit trees in and, and uh, berries and asparagus and a vegetable garden, and I'm preparing the rest of the four acres that will be in uh, in uh, an orchard, uh, so that I can plant hopefully this fall and uh, uh, maybe next spring, and continue this experiment with no-till ecological farming of of uh, tree crops. This is super inspiring, and I think this is also going to give a really interesting perspective on all of this information and experience that you've amassed and cataloged in this book, to also see it from other people who are just starting out now. So from all that you learned previously, how has that informed the way you are setting up your orchard now in order to maybe jump past a couple of the learning steps that you had in the early days? Well, I'm, I'm doing exactly what we did in Oregon, uh, uh, I have a little different though, so it's going to be it's going to be intriguing to see. Instead of a 50 year old uh, grass legume pasture, I have mostly four acres of alfalfa. So I have alfalfa grass, but I have a much higher nitrogen, lower carbon materials. Hmm. So it's going to be interesting, but I'm going to I'm going to do the same thing, the no-till. I'm going to leave my I'm going to have hay down and then uh, and then uh, mulch it for in, in each hole for where the trees are going to go. But I'm going to do it with this higher higher nitrogen, uh, lower carbon material. So 
I will, I will see what I learn. <laughs> I think my trees will grow faster, but I'm intrigued to find out what happens. Sure, sure. They may grow faster at some compromise of health or quality as they grow, no? Yes, exactly. Something exactly. That might work. Maybe another look at that is if someone were just starting out on a new piece of land or trying to transition from a conventional orchard, one in which many of the ecological cycles are broken, what advice would you give for them to get established and get those cycles kick-started once again? That's a great question about how to start because each of us has a different climate. We have different soils. We have different soil fertility. We have different microbial activity. So the first thing to do is to honestly assess where you are. What's your light? What's your soil? What's your water? All of the farming systems that I have talked about in the book have abundant water. They may not have abundant rainfall, but they have abundant, easily accessible gravity flow irrigation. If you don't have that, you, you, you need to re rethink things. So the goal is always to figure out what you have and then to figure out what you wanna grow, what your goals are and and then how to, within the context of your system and your climate, your plant community that you already have, how to push the ecosystem towards the plants you wanna grow. So here, for example, on my new farm, I'm still an orchard fiend and I still wanna have all the different, as many varieties of fruit trees as I can. I also wanna have some annual cropping and I'm gonna throw in a high tunnel so that I can have, uh, I can have food year round. I can have the annual crops that I eat year round. So how do I plan all of that and how do I, fit this in with my minimum input system. As I said, I'm really lucky in that I have a, a, a good soil. I have very good water yet again. <laughs> I have another gravity flow system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, the alfalfa hay and I'm going to bring it to the acre that doesn't have alfalfa hay that that's just in uh, uh, God forbid lawn. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use my alfalfa hay uh, because it's a, a nice uh, a high nitrogen, but still a, a, a carbon material, right? It's, it's, it's not a fancy compost. I'm not making fancy compost. I'm going to use my hay to mulch my lawn and suppress my lawn. And then eventually it's going to become, or as it already is becoming, um, uh, some of the perennial beds and some of the annual beds. Um, if my fertility, I did a soil test, if my fertility was lower, I might have brought in some micronutrients. I might have brought in some zinc and and manganese and iron. Uh, I did around every tree that I planted, I threw a little bit of nutriment and azomite. Um, I don't like to, one of my principles is to, uh, one of our ecological principles is to recycle nutrients rather than inputting, uh, bringing in mind nutrients. But for the very beginning of the trees, I'll start them out with some a, a mix of the micronutrients. So yeah. they did get that and a little bit of seaweed. But um, uh, and I and if my micronutrients had been really low, I would have added individual ones, and uh, and they weren't, so I didn't have to. So assess what your situation is, assess your resources, maybe do a soil test, and then figure out how to grow your own carbon rather than importing it, another one of the principles. And, and maybe, I'm, I have alfalfa hay, but 
I also have uh, some leaves. I would collect leaves and make, make a, a leaf mulch compost or, um, you know, lawn clippings, actually. I could let my lawn get really tall and hay it and use that as a mulch. There are so many ways to grow your own fertilizer and don't feel badly if you can't the first couple of years. If you have to bring in nutrients, that's just fine, as long as you think about it as, as a progressing system. And that maybe at some point you can bring in less and less. Right, right. Now, I know the listeners of this show would probably get on my case if I didn't bring up one obvious way of cycling nutrients, which is animals. Have you tried bringing in livestock of any different kind into especially the perennial systems as a way of cycling and bringing in nutrients? So my uh, late husband in the early 90s had uh, had uh, used some manure on his orchard and just like my system in Montana, uh, got excessive nitrogen levels. So he stopped using manure and, and didn't use animals because he felt that the animals were changing the vegetation system too much. When hmm. I when I got to when we became partners and I came to his orchard and we started farming it together, we did uh, we did experiments comparing our orchard to a neighboring orchard where they used animals. And what we found was that habitat that we were able to maintain with our, our selective mowing uh, that I told you about mowing just one side and a week later coming back and mowing the other side and then leaving the, the uh, centers of the orchard to grow really tall and wild. We found that because of that, we had uh, a, a diversity and abundance of especially beneficial insects, but other other natural enemies, but particularly parasitic wasps and predators and and ground dwelling predators like like the ground beetles and the spiders in the orchard where they were rotating through chicken, sheep, and cattle. They two things happened. Number one, they didn't have as much ground cover for the beneficial ground dwellers. Number two, the chickens ate the beetles and the spiders. And, and number three, they didn't have that season long sequential bloom of pollen and nectar to support the beneficial insects. That uh, that we had in our orchard be, because they 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 weren't able to selectively manage the habitat with the grazing, so we decided um, that 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 didn't make sense for us, and that we were using the the higher carbon nutrient cycling, and we were using our residue instead of cycling it through animals and then maybe making compost or having manure in the orchard, we were just straight applying the residue. Mm. So for those reasons, we, uh, we don't use uh, animals or grazing. And yeah, then of course, the other reason is that, uh, you know, that I don't eat animals, animals are my friends. So um, to, to not, we, we have wildlife groups coming periodically through the orchard, but we don't have animals that we would use for uh, for eating. Yeah, I understand that for sure. And it's a really good example of knowing your context and closely observing the response of the land to that kind of animal impact and deciding whether it's taking you towards the goals that you define for yourself or whether it takes you further away. Exactly. Yeah. So coming back to this project that you have now, seen as production is not the main goal on five acres, you want to play around, you want to run your experiments and continue to learn, how would you define success in this new project? Well, I'm really learning because this is the first time in my life this spring that I'm not growing almost all my own food. I'm, mm. I'm having to go to the farmer's market and... Uh, and, and buy some food because I'm 
I'm in this gap <laughs> between yeah. my old farm and my new farm. So my goal uh, always has been, but it's reinforced now. I want to grow all my food and I want to grow a diet. I want to grow a rainbow of healthy foods with all the antioxidants and vitamins and minerals. And I, I want to grow them in my ecological approach so that I'm growing not only food, but my food is medicine. So my success is being able to eat year round and not have to buy food. <laughs> and then I'd, I'd also like to have minimal ecological input as I do that, Be because I've made money farming. My late husband and I uh, did very well uh, on his orchard, particularly the last five years. I'm in a financial situation where I get to experiment. I want to push the envelope and make the mistakes that others can't afford to make to find out how far we can really get away with minimalizing inputs on a, on a farm. How 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 closed a system can we really have? Mm. So that's my my success. Uh, my my rating of success is to grow enough food that I I uh, I eat very well and I can share, and to uh, to see how many other organisms I can invite into my system, and and still have a reasonable yield of produce. Super interesting. Do you have any formulated hypotheses that are going to guide the experiments in this low input system? Do you think you can prove or disprove something that you've got in your head already? So my hypotheses are that I, I want to continue on and, and uh, try a second time in another climate this no-till orchard, growing our own fertilizer, no spray. I want to see if we can get away with it here. I, I, have, uh, I have a different climate, uh, lots of different pests here. Can we get away with the biological control organisms in the system providing enough, enough biological control that my pests are suppressed? For the annual system, I want to see with this higher nitrogen system, with the alfalfa, if I can get away with less tillage because, because I don't have, I, I, I think I'm going to have a little more available nutrients when I, when I work with this alfalfa than when I worked with that 50-year-old uh, pasture. So I'm curious to see if that's better or worse or the same. So um, some hypotheses and some just opening up to wonder and awe. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I really look forward to staying in touch as this starts to unfold and your new system really comes online. Look, Helen, thank you so much for the time that you've given so far. Before we sign off, can you tell our listeners how they can get in touch and where they can find a copy of your book? Uh, yes, uh, the book is uh, published by Chelsea Green. And um, gosh, um, the, the bookstores all over the United States have them and uh, oh i know how you can do it because of course all of us do things online now so uh, you can order the book online i happen to know that uh, barnes and noble bookstore is carrying it and and amazon is carrying it and um yeah so i think that's the way to do it uh, and i i i'm not sure i should know this uh, whether you can uh, get it online directly from Chelsea Green, but you might be able to do that too. I certainly can, and I'll be sure to put the link there because I always prefer to buy directly from the publisher instead of going through intermediaries. Thank you for knowing the answer to that question when I should know it. No worries. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. I know there was so much more in your book that we did not have a chance to explore today, but good thing you wrote it all down. So again, we'll direct everyone that direction and you and I will stay in touch. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I was late. That would have given us another 10 minutes.
No, no, there's no problem at all. I pulled you along anyway. Well, I will let you have at least a little breathing room in between now and your next interview. I know you're a popular person, so you're going to need to take some some downtime as well. Uh, but Helen, this was so much fun. I really appreciate not only all of this wealth of knowledge that you took the time to put in here, but the fact that you're going on with your experiments is such an inspiration as well. Let's definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. I want to hear how your orchard does. And thank you so much for being patient with me and figuring out that I guess this is what I needed to be able to make it work. Thanks once again to Helen. I've included the link to where you can buy a copy of her book at chelseagreen.com through the show notes in this episode on the website at regenerativeskills.com. Now, before we wrap this up, just remember that these episodes are only the beginning of the learning resources, design and coaching services, in-person courses, and interactive community that are available through Regenerative Skills. The Discord server is our free community where you can connect with other like-minded listeners, exchange ideas, stories, tips, and resources, as well as interact with me directly and quite a few former guests from this show. Our Instagram account, at regen underscore skills, is the best place to see the projects that me and the team are working on, both for clients and collaborators, as well as on our own properties. I'll also be announcing the certification courses, workshops, and gatherings that we've got coming up later this year. If you're interested in getting dedicated support for your own project, you can now schedule a free planning session with one of our team members through the request form on our website. You can also find all the links, show notes, and past resources there at regenerativeskills.com. We truly believe that no matter your experience, your knowledge, abilities, resources, or background, you can be a powerful force for regeneration on this planet, and we're here to help you find your path. So as always, remember to keep taking those little steps every day towards a regenerative future, and I'll be right by your side along the way.